Welcome everyone. My name is Kasper and I'm honored to moderate today's Rootcamp webinar supported by Agritechnica. For that, I'm pleased uh, to have an outstanding lineup of speakers with me to discuss and uh, to provide hopefully fruitful, a fruitful discussion and uh, some insights and lots of inspiration. The topic will be uh, digital future decision making systems in agriculture. Without further ado, I would like to introduce you to Sanya, co founder of Cropped, Dimitri, co founder of Geopart, Christian, a regenerative entrepreneur, and professor of the University of Weinstein and Triestoff, Peter. And before we maybe jump right into the topic, I would like to introduce Rootcamp to those who do not know us. So, yes, Rootcamp is a Rootcamp is a multi corporate innovation hub for the agri food and agri tech and bioeconomy. And our vision is it to build an ecosystem to solve the most and biggest pressing challenges at the root with innovations. The mission is here to bring corporates and startups together and to um, yeah, accelerate their growth and bring the innovation actually to market and um, into action. We tackle um, yeah, the upstream process um, from the agri-food value chain, from agriculture inputs to agribusinesses, R&D and processing, up to sustainability. So we touch multiple topics, they all interfere and um, yes. We do this not alone. We have many, many partners. Uh, I would like to mention here, especially K plus S and KWS and as well Hannover Impulse, Agritechnica and KPMG to make this all happen and to support our program. What programs do we actually offer in detail? So, as I said, our mission is to implement the implementation of innovation. So, we have kind of three pro, um, programs. The first and most common for, uh, in our uh, root camp is the early stage startup accelerator. Uh, it's a three month acceleration, acceleration, acceleration program for startups and hopefully ends mostly in an integration um, project with a corporate partner. At the moment, we have the second batch. Uh, running and our third batch is open for application. The later stage program is the tech implementation program. We uh, pick a startup together with a corporate and try to yeah, bring this technology into the corporate world and to implement actually into products and bring it to market. And the third is more an entrepreneurial and incubation program. So we kick off uh, with a corporate and the idea a generation and then hopefully bring live an MVP to test it. Our portfolio companies at the moment from this batch one and two, you see over uh, multiple fields. Um, we hope for the third batch who's live now, you can also apply on our webpage. Uh, we hope to fill some spots to have a very diverse top uh, yeah, set of portfolio companies as we see lots of overlap here and there. Yes, if you have questions, you can reach out to us um, um, at any time. Um, this webinar is a series. So yesterday we had a robotic um, seminar, uh, yeah, webinar, and on the 1st and 2nd February, we will have two more webinars in circular economy and soil micro, for the soil microbiome. So register for it. Um, yes, without uh, now, you have a little introduction to RootCamp. I will stop my presentation and will hand over to you. So, yes, this is uh, yeah to set the frame. As I said, the digital future decision making systems in agriculture will be our topic today, um, and I'm very happy to uh, give you now the word to give a little um, introduction to yourself and your field of business. So we set the ground and then start into the discussion. And um, yes, I would love. Peter, if you could start from the university standpoint, and as I know, you are a farmer as well, I think to give a good start what the university and a farmer 
thinks about this topic is a good start. Yeah, thank you very much, Kaspar. Thank you for the introduction and the invitation to this webinar. Um, at our University of Applied Sciences in Triesdorf, we currently are running a research, an applied research project on the adoption of digital technologies in agriculture, especially focusing, uh, focusing on smaller farms in southern Germany. And uh, what are our learnings so far uh, from this uh, research project? So one aspect is that um, we see a big difference in adoption of what I would call agronomic versus non-agronomic solutions. So if you think about steering system or if you think about um, automated uh, nozzle shutoff systems to, to reduce overlaps, these are systems, you know, you can also use these systems on a parking lot and they also work. So there is no agronomic aspects involved in these technology systems. And then we have agron agronomic systems like variable rate application of fertilizer or seed where you have a strong impact on <clears throat> on the outcome or on the benefit of the solution depending on your conditions. So the weather, the soil, the crop and so on. And what we're seeing is that reliability and visibility of the value that solutions provide are very important for adoption. So for example, if you have a steering system, you always see that it works. It, it, it drives the tractor straight on the field very precisely. It's always reliable. It doesn't matter which weather you have, which soil, which year, and it's visible. You know, farmers can see the uh, benefit. If you look at variable rate application of nitrogen, this really depends, the benefit depend on the year, on the weather, on the crop, on your growing conditions, and it's also hard to, to really measure the effect. Yeah, so it's really hard and also in our research to really measure the effect of variable rate application. Yeah, so if you do strip trials on your field <clears throat> and you use a lot of statistics, we weren't able to measure huge benefits, so it's, it's quite tough to do that. <clears throat> And nonetheless, we see a big benefit also for smaller farms that the costs are going down for digital, te uh, digital technologies, that we see a lot of the required components are already in base configuration of machines. So you have already fertilizer spreaders or sprayers or tractors that have basic controllers and all the hardware stuff you need to do uh, precision agriculture on your machines already. <clears throat> Although the costs are going down, we still see a um, very high share of what we call learning costs. You know, the farmers have to learn and, and understand all the agronomic complexities that are increasing the more you precise, the more precise you get with your decision making. So I believe decision making is getting more important because the complexity of decisions increases because you have more ability to adopt and let's say influence your uh, cropping system and um, so that's why i think this is a very important aspect to have more decision making systems better decision making systems and even what we call prescriptions you know that you give a farmer a certain recommendation based on ai or other technologies uh, I also believe when it comes to adoption of these technologies that we have to think about what is what uh, what is called outcome based pricing. So if you just sell a farm or a product and say, you know, this helps you to do it to to improve your bottom line. Um, the, the faster new technologies evolve, the harder it gets to really convince farmers because, you know, they're not often they're, they're skeptical about new technologies and um, when you adjust your pricing to the outcome that the technology provides, then this can help to overcome this, let's say, this, this, this hurdle to, to adoption. So this is one recommendation that we also are doing some research on right now, but we see already some, some benefits doing that. Um, the question I have is at the end, if we have a lot of, let's say, decision support systems, prescription farming and all of types of support systems. The question is, what is actually the job of the farmer in the end? You know, what will the farmer have to do in the end? What is his, which decisions will he take? And um, how can farms differentiate themselves from others if all the decisions are made by some smart systems out there? And I think this is something where we have to think about also from a farmer perspective, you know, not only about how to make decisions better, but also how to differentiate themselves because also farmers want to 
be competitive and maybe grow and uh, and and not be some kind of a just just a landowner that provides land for agribusiness companies to do decisions and work on. So uh, I think this is something to keep in mind. So that was my initial statement. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. That was very interesting and very nice. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and yes, from, from my experience um, working in this industry for a while, yes, this is a process and there will be, luckily, I guess, not all decisions ready by tomorrow and then he's just switched from no decision at all to all automated. So I think this will be a progress, hopefully, and an evolution. So I would love to maybe hear some uh, insights from Sanya and how she approaches this with her technology. And I would love to hear your um, yeah, impulse presentation. Yeah, thank you, Kasper, and also thank Peter for this uh, lovely introduction because uh, we we align at some, at some points. Uh, I will share my uh, screen. Just to. So I'm uh, coming from the cropped that we uh, developed solution, artificial intelligence based solution for agriculture of, of the future. Uh, the main problem that we are solving is uh, what to plant where and to illustrate how difficult it is, we have several objectives like profit, climate resilience, uh, risk, then we need to take into the account varieties, hybrids, uh, um, logistics of the farm. And then the number of the combinations just explodes from 14 fields where number of the combination, it's number of humans and uh, with uh, 30 fields, we are at the number of the stars in the universe. And uh, traditionally, uh, this decision is made by farmers uh, usually uh, business as usual, like uh, previous uh, years and uh, uh, some experience from from his grandfather, and etc. But with the uh, artificial intelligence based solution, we demonstrate that we can increase the profit and decrease the, the risk, but we need uh, uh, good data to, to, to achieve uh, these um, goals. And our journey started from Syngenta data and uh, building the recommendation system for the soybean and then continued uh, through all of these years, uh, having uh, more data and uh, making the, the system more um, uh, reliable. How uh, our solutions looks like for the farmers, uh, so it's the uh, digital recommendation system for its fields and uh, it can decide uh, which crop varieties uh, he will uh, have eventually for, for his season uh, with uh, optimal diversification. Um, uh, the aim is to have the highest profit at acceptable risk and uh, as we hear in, uh, in previous uh, talk, uh, there is some decisions also on farmer because uh, it's it can uh, uh, decide what can what risk uh, can he um, sustain. Um, on the other side of the coin, uh, we are building the recommendation system for the seed companies. So we are scaling up from the farmer toward the uh, entire region. Here is the North Serbia and our company Delta Agra that is producing the uh, seed uh, uh, varieties of the, the soybean. So we can really precisely uh, tell them uh, uh, on the on the, this regional scale uh, where is uh, the best place for uh, their varieties. And so they, they can optimize the, the, the production of the seed, but also the, the retail. And uh, also the important component is the uh, yield forecast so that they know what to expect uh, uh, first at the beginning of the season. It's just the potential of the yield, but as season goes, then we can update the, the information. And also the important part is the risk estimation because not all locations are uh, uh, the same when it comes to the risks. Some are more um, uh, affected by, by the weather uh, conditions and, and the changes. So uh, with further modification, we can deliver the product for the, for example, banks, because then based on the yield risk um, crops that farmers is having, uh, we can decide um, 
and provide data-driven assessment of the, of the client. So this is more toward the, the, the insurance and the, and the bank uh, companies. What is the uh, baseline for this kind of the solution? So it's the data. And we rely on data intensive sources like uh, satellite data, uh, soil data, then the, the climate and weather data. But we also need uh, historical year uh, records. This is the hardest part to, to, to get. Um, and that's why the digitalization of this sector is uh, highly important. And then we can play around with the uh, with the machine learning with the portfolio optimization so many uh, artificial intelligence tools uh, in order to provide for example uh, recommendation for this field you need to put a maze and then you have the ideas of the hybrids and the percentage and the, the currently we do more with the companies because they have more data uh, that we can use to build the models but not all companies are equally digitalized i would say we were surprised with very bright examples but examples where they are lacking the the, the digitalization and the next phase we will go uh, toward the farmers through the farm management information system as additional tool that they can uh, utilize and uh, our team is growing very interdisciplinary data science, business, uh, soil uh, science, and uh, I'm co-founder with, uh, with Oscar. And uh, what we see that agriculture must embrace this digital transformation. And <laughs> once we have this kind of the data, no human can comprehend uh, such a quantity. So we will need artificial intelligence solution. So that's it from. Anja, thank you very much. Uh, I am what was very interesting as I was working for a seed company for almost four years, so yeah. I, uh, I can relate. And um, this is very interesting, especially the approach first with seed companies, big, big companies and now going further down the road, closer to the farmer, to the farm management system, to the farmers who actually use those systems already. So they are probably the first ones you can hopefully win. Very interesting and I have some questions also for you later. Um, but maybe now if, uh, I hand over to Christian um, and would be interested if he would like to use this already and how he is doing it at the moment um, with his companies and on his, yeah, hand over. Thank you. Yes, thank you and thank you for the invitation. Uh, nice for uh, being here and uh, show you what we are doing. My name is Christian Hennig. I'm the co-founder of Perma Robotics. And what we are doing is we are rather working on a system level. So we are integrating existing technologies, as you already said. Um, if they are not available, we are able to build them on our own. Like we are building our own robots, like the Permabot we recently introduced at Impact Festival, but also LoRaWAN based sensor nets like we did for Globe Foundation in Switzerland recently. Or we are uh, software developers, full stack developers uh, that make use of these actors and sensors to build integrated solutions. And all of this is possible because we are using a semantic language that we are, we developed and now made public available, which is called a RAL link or a RAL. The, what the special part is, is that we are focusing on a part of agriculture that at the moment barely exists. It's called regenerative agriculture, but our bet is that this is the agriculture of the fourth agricultural revolution. Um, but if this will be the case, it will get much more complex than uh, Sanya uh, just told us because we will reintegrate livestock yeah, that we removed from the fields in the 70s. We will have multi-year or fully cropping, so we will mix crops on the fields. We will have agroforests and all of this stuff makes it even more difficult to handle by humans. But we have the tools of the fourth industrial revolution, yeah, which this time maybe can save our ass because the first three revolutions made our planet uh, feeling less uh, comfortable and less inhabitable. So let's cross the fingers that the fourth industrial revolution gives us the solutions to get a better agriculture in the future that is more compatible with our planet. So from a bird's eye view, and Sanya touched a lot of these uh, topics already, the farmer should be in the middle, 
and he should be uh, the, the owner and the, the handler of the data. And this can be done by these farm management information systems that could or should bring together all the data that we have, the data streams. So they come from the soil, they come from the weather, they come from the, but also come from the regulatory bodies, from the suppliers, from the markets, finance, insurance companies, advisors, and so on. And there's not only one decision, there are many decisions. So farmers make decisions, suppliers make decisions, customers, and so on. So we have a lot of decision streams that are overwhelming the farmers. And as Sanya told us, the gut feeling still is the main driver today. But we can make much more sense out of the data if we use modern technologies like artificial intelligence. So what are the three steps that we think are needed to, to have those transition from gut-driven decision to data-driven decision? The first step is we need to understand the data. Uh, so there is a saying, uh, metadata are love letters to the future of data. So you need to know what your data mean. And uh, I guess a lot of those people and companies are spending a lot of time to bring existing data out of their silos back into data structures they can work with. But there is a solution out originally invented by or introduced by Tim Berners-Lee, which is the semantic web, which means that we can give information a meaning and we can exchange this meaning between us and uh, we can reuse data. And so if we have the semantics in our data, the next step is we need trust in our data. And nowadays, trust is just brought by humans. But if we want to make it more reliable, we should think about using blockchain technology to get the trust into the data. I'm just aware of a small company in, in Potsdam, Stenon, that takes uh, soil samples uh, on the point of care and is directly translating it to the blockchain, if I'm right. So this is a, a good approach to make sure that the data from the point of uh, existence or taking the data until to the data management systems and the AI are trustworthy. And the next and the final step, once you have trustworthy data that has a meaning, we have to reason about the data and conclude on the data. And as I said, my bet is similar to Sonia that the AI based decision process will reveal a lot of advantages for the farmers and also the other stakeholders. So we worked in the past on step number one because there are a lot, is a lot of ongoing efforts both in, uh, from companies and, and uh, governments to have a, a standardized model in agriculture for data. But as long as it is not yet there and working, we are using what we learned in the past and uh, we coined it a regenerative agriculture language, RAL because we are able using those semantic web technologies not only to digitize the objects, but also all processes in the world. So we have um, digital uh, models for a harvest process, a selling or a buying process, a cultivation process, and we feed the objects, the standardized objects into these, uh, into these processes. And then we have uh, processors that can take these processes and make sense out of it and generate new objects. And we made this freely accessible uh, uh, at uh, Heal the Earth Foundation, uh, open access, free to use uh, during a REST API uh, if you are working with regenerative practices. We not only developed these RAR links, we also implemented this together with our partners. For instance, we used this uh, combination of partners to make a complete workflow from the from the field to the to the customer. So we use CAN uh, machinery and make it smart to get the, the, the weights of the, the goods into the cloud. And in the cloud, there's Rucola Soft, which is a crop uh, cropping planner that is automatically giving us the, the, the plan. We are matching it with the, the harvested good and putting it back to the cloud, RucolaSoft. And from RucolaSoft, it's getting to Footroots, which has a, a, a point of sale direct to customer app to sell those goods to the customers. And at the end of the chain, we have a smart pickup point 
which is produced by Pharma Robotics, which uh, is then giving those uh, goods and foods uh, back to the customers. And all those stakeholders are talking to each other uh, using RAN language. And so it took us only some weeks to generate this new product solution. And uh, coming back to decision systems, uh, we are now proud to have a new partner, which is Soil Diagnostics, which will use RAL to uh, collect different uh, soil and plant health data from different companies and uh, will present this to the farmer and later on uh, doing also AI based diagnostics and decision. Uh, if the customer likes this. So if he wants to be uh, using his own decision as a farmer, he just uses the aggregator. And if he wants to make use of the AI, he can use the AI to get a decision made out of, of, of many different data. And we will launch this on Ecofeld Target 2022. That's us. Thank you, Christian. This was very interesting. Personally, I'm very interested in regenerative farming and I love to see um, more and more initiatives so this technology or this approach to agriculture also can scale. And so thank you very much. I, I'm, I have so many questions already, so I have to hold back. And as this was already uh, quite techy and I like it, and um, this is also, of course, if we talk about decision making systems uh, necessary, uh, but I would like to hand over to Dimitri uh, to um, yeah, tell us a bit about his system. Yeah, excited to be here. Thank you everybody and uh, looking forward to a great con conversation because we really have uh, different experience and uh, look at this at agriculture from different sides. Uh, do you currently see my screen, which uh, I'm sharing? Yes. Kaspar, yeah, OK, yes. great. So I'm a co-founder of Geopart. Geopart is a data-driven precision agriculture platform. So a uh, problem which we ha has as a humanity is a little bit beyond uh, precision agriculture, right? It's growing population, it's pushing, and uh, that agriculture pushed to be more sustainable and at the same time more efficient. And sometimes this is really contradictional things. And a uh, huge amount of data, growing co uh, prices for fertilizers and uh, precision agriculture, of course, is not the answer, the only answer and not answer to all the questions, but uh, it is really useful and especially it's useful on medium and large scale uh, uh, fields. And uh, according to many research, like uh, average difference of uh, final outcome of yield on high zones, high spots within one field and low zones is about four four times. It means that you have four times more yield in one zone, and four times uh, less yield in another zone. And you can actually manage this with precision agriculture and use reduce costs of fertilizer, you reduce costs of seeds, of crop protection, and uh, have uh, an average like safe about 30% of on ag inputs and uh, Sometimes also you see increase on yield. Sometimes you do not see increase on yield, but it's another story which already was mentioned here. And uh, interesting question, since uh, amount of data is growing, it's not clear how to make these decisions, what to do, because uh, like modern agronomy has very different practices and very different soil types, very different weather. In some regions we have two vegetation seasons per, per year and some just one. And, it's really very local and there are some best practices. And uh, what we do in Geopart is that we believe that single layer is never enough in agriculture to make good decisions. And uh, we are the platform which aggregates all the data from public uh, sources, from uh, customers' data, from, from private sources, and we provide useful automations. We provide automation, cre automated creation of variable rate application maps, automated recommendations regarding uh, scouting, benchmarking of fields by heterogeneity, by productivity. Uh, we create field profile, including topography, 3D maps of topography, and also starting from next year, we will do some recommendations and analytics uh, related to carbon offsets and other greenhouses gases offsets and also we do recommendations um, related to biodiversity practices we can recommend 
way it makes sense, for example, to uh, to remove part of the farm or field from the regular crop rotation and seed some flowers or trees. Yeah. And our analytics is provided via our web mobile applications and also is provided to our clients uh, who are sometimes like other active companies or could be directly integrated into uh, machinery. And uh, what we do, what we believe that a uh, system should be very practical in terms that we do not solve big problems like saying that big data, artificial intelligence, whatever, but we try to automate concrete operations like jobs to be done, for example, soil sampling planning. And we have a tool to make to automate soil sampling uh, based on zones approach or based on grid sampling approach. Then uh, when we say about fertilizing, uh, there are many questions about fertilizing. Then we try to automate this and we do it like job by job. And uh, our team is very experienced. We had another startup and it was acquired by Bio. In Bio, we built Xarvio system and starting from 2019, we built independent ag analytics system Geopart. We have already different clients. Uh, among our clients, mostly agronomic companies, not farmers directly, uh, but uh, guys who recommend and create plans for, for farmers. And also we work with uh, some ag input, ag uh, producer, uh, uh, large scale crop producers and also, for example, research organizations like Iowa Soybean Association, our client. So this is some kind of perspective in terms of where we are now and where we are move, moving to. Because we see that uh, technological progress is not there yet that we can really calculate everything. We cannot recommend in automated manner for any field, uh, recommend all the recommendations in terms of absolute numbers, how how much to put uh, at which time. But we in general moving into this and with more, uh, with better satellite imagery, with better sensors, uh, we'll go into, the, into prescriptive modeling, totally automated prescriptive modeling, I believe maybe in the next five, 10 years. And here is an example of one of our modules that we do multi-layer analysis of satellite imagery and provide uh, field potential maps based on many data layers. Also, we aggregate topography together with uh, satellite imagery. We create maps in a totally automated manner, which are very similar and very predictive, very similar to yield data of, uh, of farms. Uh, we have also model where we build 3D uh, model directly in the browser and it helps to understand like different data layers and uh, limiting factors of yield. And uh, there are many use cases about, but I want just uh, very quickly share one uh, one short video. These guys are our clients from Canada. What they do, they scan field in real time using electrical conductivity sensor, and also they have soil moisture sensor uh, installed uh, at the back of their car. And this data is sent automatically via API to our system. We immediately create uh, variable rate application maps and they're uh, implemented then on the field. Yeah, and also we do the same strategies for uh, variable rate seeding, for crop protection, for automation of uh, scouting tasks, uh, for planning and uh, uh, planning of soil sampling and uh, doing variable rate application of fertilizers. Yeah, that's in short what what we're doing in our company. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dimitri, for this um, a nice overview about the services and the technology you're using. Um, also here, as I heard, very um, complex amount, a huge amount of data, and to bring this into actionable insights and action and actions, uh, this is quite uh, challenging. And you're using most at the moment middleman to bring it actually to the farmer. I think this is what I would like also maybe to hear a little bit uh, about the adoption, how you think this will, uh, what are the best approaches that pharma come into usage of this technology and how this will develop over the next maybe two or three years as we, um, yes, um, would say that this for adoption, the adoption is mostly the crucial part for this decision system. So they have to be tested and tried and the, the yeah, the risk or the, 
uncertainty around it needs to be eliminated so the farmer can try it. So I would like to maybe hand over to yeah the group and to start this discussion and uh, would love to hear some opinions and some experience with uh, you had maybe by your own as a farmer or uh, talking to farmers um, with this or clients in this case. Yeah, maybe I can I can start. So um, <clears throat> we did an interesting, I would call it an experiment. I think it was now last year or two years ago. Uh, we asked uh, in Germany several providers that provide prescription maps for corn seeding or corn planting to provide us their uh, prescription recommendations for several fields that uh, we have with some of our farms that we work with for our trials. And interestingly, these maps were very that they had a very low correlation. So if you look from a farmer perspective, the question is, what is the right map? So who can who supports farmers to, let's say, trust uh, recommendations or decision systems? And for example, if you if you buy a tractor, you have the DLG, the German Agriculture Association. They do tractor tests, you know, they test the tractor or you have yield trials of new varieties. Yeah, these are governmental organizations. They do uh, yield trials. And what I think is important, we need some kind of a somehow independent organization or governmental organization that really basically provides quality assurance to these types of um, uh, support systems at the end. Because I, I don't see farmers being able to judge, you know, what is the right system. And that, that is a big issue because the same as we, we need the support to uh, decide which seed to grow based on independent trials. We need the same also for this support system. That's my personal opinion. Then they have no time. Yeah, they every harvest counts. They cannot just sacrifice one harvest to use the, the wrong map. Exactly. Uh, what my question, direct question, would be: uh, evidence-based data would be very important. So, is there evidence-based data that from universities, and that's why we need you? Uh, that shows that those maps really make a difference, evidence-based, not just expert opinion. Um, the, the, the problem is um, when you look at, for example, variable rate application. So if you, if you have a seed variety and you do seed trials, you can basically, from a statistics point of view, you can use different environments and then you basically can uh, calculate only the effect of the genetics on yield. If you look at variable rate application, the benefit of variable rate application depends on your location. So you cannot, uh, let's say, um, basically uh, um, find or, or define or investigate the value of a variable rate application technology independent of the location, like, like a seed variety. So, so this is one, one problem that you cannot use a ceteris paribus approach to evaluate um, precision farming uh, technologies. And that, that's a big issue because every farm will have a different soil and the benefit will be different. So you, can have, you, can, you cannot do a general recommendation like a seed recommendation. But what you could do is you can help farmers to do their own trials. So what we call like on-farm research. And I think that is the important thing. So maybe we need for these types of technologies like uh, uh, variable rate application or, or recommendations how to implement variable rate technologies. If we, we need to support farms to do their trials and to investigate their value. I think that is something that uh, because we cannot provide a general recommendation because variable rate depends on your location. So you cannot have a general recommendation like for seed, for example. Yeah, few cents from my side, like uh, maybe we can here take a look at American experience. What they have is uh, non-profit organizations like Iowa Soybean Association and they do uh, trials only for Iowa farmers and they then create recommendations only for Iowa farmers and guys from Ohio or Mississippi they do not believe in these trials because they know that they will not work and there is a joke that how to uh, fail with your sale to farmer in Ohio say that it works in Iowa so <laughs> they, they they understand that it's totally original different right that's that's one thing that could be done 
and like non it should be non-profit organization because if it's driven by for profit companies and everybody will just market themselves and say that we're the best uh, guys etc and another trend which i see and it's mostly in eastern europe work with some agri holdings for example that they uh, provide uh, they do a lot of trials since they have a lot of resources obviously a lot of land right they do a lot of trials and then they provide this uh, results insights to smaller farmers but they agree with farmers on some things for example they agree that they will buy grain from this farmer uh, in, in exchange to this insights that's also like one of business model which is possible but it's it works when you have consolidation and uh, larger agri companies which is currently like uh, mostly in eastern europe or brazil for example yeah, and from from crop experience with the with the companies, we always start with some pilot project because uh, they really need to see uh, what we are uh, offering, and then to have the one season in, in this pilot to to uh, try to estimate the, the the value. Without this, there there is no just oh I will pick this product. And of course, it's also important uh, to be flexible to be part of their system. Them. So it's not just the oh we are developing this. No one want to see ten of the application for for one uh, business. And also for for farming, it's um, it's reluctant to change. So uh, you need to have these gradual steps. For example, uh, our recommendation system: farmer can put their inputs. Okay, he will select. He wants to have the maize uh, at the third part of the their field so this is something you need to provide him also freedom not to jump in uh, into completely entire uh, new way of business yeah but uh, how then unit economics works for you if you have so large cycle uh, as, as a, obviously not a huge company right startup or medium-sized company then you just test for one year and then only for the next year, farmer can sell some some amount of your services. That's right. It's very tough also for startups and in yeah. our industry problems that everybody are saying about uh, problems of farmers. But also there are a lot of companies who want to be useful and create useful stuff. But because of cycle of agronomy ag agriculture, one year cycle of for testing everything. Uh, many companies became bankrupt because of that. That's also an issue. Yeah, th this is the issue for the for the startup companies. Now we are surviving based on the uh, some public money investment in the startups in, in Serbia and uh, Europe. So we were in several incubator programs that uh, let us to play around with the pilots and then convince the company. So, but without this, it would be impossible. It's very interesting to look into the round and as we talked about the lag, this one you waiting and and if you as a farmer or every person naturally you just test a little piece a little bit to get an experience. So every year just a little bit is very slow <laughs> in a very fast moving field. So I think this is also um, a very typical um, I would say bottleneck or uh, holds a bit the industry back because it's very difficult to scale fast if farmers want to test a little bit and, and but I think it's it's a typical approach and maybe we should and can help uh, farmers to uh, I'm actually this is not often in business you're not that easy go to I, I make a big test and this is complicated and if tests are not that always super easy to set up and to maintain they're not trained in setting up tests and um, so I think there's the middleman you were talking about Sanya and Dimitri you have players in between and also Christian that not everything you can do as a startup directly with a with a farmer sometimes you need lots of more people in between to um, make it happen yes Maybe yeah there's one, one, yes, go one ahead. important uh, topic here and we we touched this already is trust yeah how did the farmers can trust us yeah? and that's very important to to make this very transparent what we are doing and and why and who's influencing us yeah, is this just because somebody wants to sell crops or fertilizer 
or is it our own business model and uh, where do the data go where do, do they belong and so they need tools to build trust yeah they had they have their uh, experts their advisors and uh, when they come in and say okay you can trust this uh, software then maybe they trust it yeah? or they have a huge community yeah they are all connected and they are exchanging about your software and then they listen to the, the opinion leaders, to the agra bloggers and what they find useful, they, it might have a chance. And sometimes I'm thinking that the bigger companies have not the better products, they just have the better trust building chains. Yeah. So maybe this is the, the, the own difference. Totally agree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would like to dig deeper there a little bit because if I look at corporates and some of them get very big and it's kind of a monopoly here and there, then the trust might even go lower again a bit because they are too uh, profit driven maybe. So I think there's, there's uh, I would say, a right range of trust. And of course, every company is very close to the customer and everybody's talking about what was really talking to the customers all the time and adapting and listening to them and has a conversation, not just a community with likes, just really conversations, focus groups and work, then this community and word of mouth, oh yes, they're listening and they see our problems and troubles and they react. I think this is uh, also a start to build trust. So um, maybe this is a question of the round, how everyone is approaching to build this trust with farmers? What is What are your um, approaches to build, get this trust into your technology? Well, in our case, we are communicating a lot with the uh, advisors and uh, uh, for example, if we are approaching the, the farmers, then we are talking to, to advisors that know the fields and uh, they are already doing some recommendations for, for the farmers and they see potential to as a um, support system for their further uh, business. And in companies, we always uh, have a big interaction with, the, with their agronomy. And it's uh, uh, it's a, a play with them because the, when we start, there is the lack of trust, and then we gradually build it. For example, when we provided this map for the seed regionalization, they were surprised uh, with the with the information that they see first uh, quantified. I would say because there. There is some in the back of their head, uh, the, the all the knowledge that they collected during the years, but then they see and they can judge it uh, based on that. And then we uh, iterate for, for the next step. So I would say advisors for us and, and uh, agronomists in, in companies. And visualization. So really show them by example, yes, to make it uh, visible to the eye, not just, yeah some magic in the back and then you have a decision. Yes, <laughs> very interesting. Yeah, uh, our approach to this is that we decided from the very beginning and since we like uh, know all the players on the market, like there are some companies which build like black box solutions, some companies build very few bu built white box solutions. We decided to build white box solution, which is not, uh, not common uh, currently because Everybody just do some modeling, some automation at AI, machine learning uh, tech to that, and that's it, right? But uh, we build tools which are like we see uh, like incremental uh, improvement to the tools from 90s, like uh, and uh, 2000s, like SMS Advanced, for example, that every farmer, every agronomist used SMS Advanced. It's like uh, just spatial and farming system, and they have all their data layers. We, our, our approach, we see that it's useful to have the same, but in the cloud, it allows shared work, it allows more automation, automated uh, loading of data layers. That I think, like for us, it worked well because we see that uh, also agronomists they see value of our system. Okay, it could be similar to what they already seen in the past. It may be not that advanced in terms of AI, right? And it's sometimes difficult to sell, to sell it, especially to venture capitalists, etc. But uh, you gain trust uh, from this approach. And for us, I think it's, it was a uh, right decision. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for us, it's a, it's a people to people business. Yeah, so the main trust comes from, from, from building trust between the humans. So, so we are talking every week, every day with uh, 
with farmers, you know, we do this on a technical level, but uh, if, if you know Spartenprobe.de, where René and I are a farmer and a, a nerd, uh, you can see that we try to put it on a more easy to use level to, to just learn from each other. Uh, what is possible out there? What are the real problems and how can we make these problems uh, maybe easier? And then comes the next uh, the level of trust. So if you can touch something and you can see something moving, then it's easy to get trust. And so if you watch a, a farmer for the first time using an automated robot or even tractor, yeah, you will see his, oh God. And then slowly he builds trust that this machine really drives the right or wrong way. <laughs> um, but it's difficult with something that you can touch like, like software and uh, AI. Yeah, so this is really difficult. It's easier to have a, maybe a, a robot or a, a, a good UI or whatever that you can touch somehow to build trust. I, I would never trust the AI, it's too abstract for me. Yeah. So that's something that's difficult to, to build from a company perspective, how you can build trust into something that is not touchable. Yes. What I think of often is also that the approach, how anybody in the value chain is approaching this new technologies, they have, everyone has his own biases. So, uh, and that to remove them and to get into the experimentation mode and the test mode and to compare stuff and not jump to conclusions or jump to one solution first, but make the analysis. So what I at least uh, also know from what we mentioned already for software, there's no certification. And if there are certification, there are many of them. And the one certification says it's awesome. The other says it's not awesome or the, the, uh, the press and the media. So there's always a, a big discussion also about this. They look at the same thing, but that one counts three, the other counts four. And um, what I would also maybe um, would think it would be a big plus that everyone is testing multiple things and taking time multiple sources and it gets this mind space or this approach to things to test and to give it a try that we have to encourage and to also maybe motivate on this uh, approach i think maybe one one thing to add is i also totally support what christian said um and i don't know if you know rachel Boltzmann, she's an author and writes a lot about technology and trust and she says basically that you need competence or you have to show competence reliability uh, that you create trust but you also have to demonstrate integrity and empathy so you have to and i think this is an important part so which only goes basically through a personal connection i think um that you that your customers get the feeling that really you are you try to understand their problem you try to solve their problem i mean this is a big issue and not just having some kind of a website where some <laughs> farmers log on and this totally unpersonal um type of of solutions i think they will have a hard time so i think a personal connection and really um being empathic or, or show empathy towards uh, issues, problems and challenges that farmers face, I think can be a big uh, support there. I would even see a challenge for the farmer that there is an overload of the softwares and approaches and companies approaching them. So yeah. especially the ones who are a bit more advanced and test a lot. They, mm -hmm. Every startup knows, oh, that one is very innovative and he's testing mm -hmm. stuff, but he's mostly overloaded with thousands of options mm -hmm. and and this is also dependent on the person in this farm. So maybe also maybe if you look to livestock technology or some, the herd manager, which is one level below the decision maker, maybe mostly they should be very connected, but um, there's a big gap. And if it's really, yeah, depending on the people and there's an overload of technology. So how should they pick the one? So we, I think I'm closing almost the loop to the beginning. Who's helping the farmer? making a decision or navigating through all this decision-making systems and offerings, what at the moment is the right decision to look at from the prioritization? Is it picking the right crop? Is it variable rate? Is it, oh, should I shift from organic farming to regenerative farming even? Or um, should I go back to, to university and learn something about because I have no, no clue? <laughs> so I think this also that there is no, uh, there's, or there's need for more guidance and navigation through all these um, topics. And this is something that we like the advisors move to. They should really work with all the softwares and it should be important. So we are at the moment trying to, to help a new company getting into the gears that uh, is doing advice 
based on farmers' knowledge, yeah, really people, real farmers going there, but they also need to know about the software tools because the farmers need it. And we have some initial uh, farms where we, we try this at the moment and we make a new onboarding process. And the onboarding process this time is know your farm from a um, perspective of a businessman. So what are your numbers? And next is what can we choose as a farm management system? And this is, I guess, the task that the advisor has to take and has to be paid for to guide those farmers into the right digital pipeline. As we're approaching the end of this webinar, I would love to maybe just give um, everyone the chance to give his outlook on the next two, three years, what happening in this field and what he's, yeah, what he, his best guess and maybe wishes. <laughs> but um, yes, that would be a good closing round, I hope. Who wants to start? Ladies is first. Please. Okay, <laughs> this hard question. Okay, uh, well, uh, I believe that we are all on, on good track and uh, the important issues that will emerge are uh, interoper interoperability between the different solution. For example, if we see the, 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 the three one presented here, uh, they have some parts that could be connected together, but for the farmers, it, it is not possible to, 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 to do it. Uh, and we need to simplify this chain uh, into the, for example, farm management system so that to make it easy. From the perspective of Serbia, where we have a lot of information, we see already a quarter of the farmers in our region using digital technology. There are some um, new um, settings um, uh, popping out like a digital village where they can uh, easily compare with their neighbors because they are in similar agroecological conditions. So then they can learn from, from other uh, experience. So I think it will uh, evolve uh, eventually and uh, there there is no way to, to this that will be uh, stopped it's just it will uh, quantify the better the value that farmer uh, gets and we need this uh, several years more for these transitions Thank you. dimitri you want to go for next yeah mm. So, so a lot to say that I'm not sure how, <laughs> what I want Just to say. One minute. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, I, I believe that uh, like more penetration of uh, knowledge about tools, about uh, successful use cases from different regions, uh, uh, it will increase and uh, more and more precision agriculture will be used in uh, any country. And uh, drivers of this growth uh, are about I believe uh, 4G in rural areas, uh, IoT will develop a lot. Uh, development of technologies, aut automation, also automation in uh, robotics, what was discussed yesterday is another story. And uh, but in the end, uh, we need to understand that a current level of technology doesn't allow us to automate everything. And another question, do we want really to automate everything? And uh, the, was very said as in the very beginning to want to like uh, give all the automation to algorithms. Thank you. Christian? <laughs> uh, yes, I think it will be a wide, wide west within the next five, ten years. We will see a lot of uh, startups coming and going, a lot of technologies coming and going. And uh, I hope there will be a survival of the fittest, not the survival of that that have the most of the money. Uh, but I'm quite optimistic there. Yeah. So there, there will be a totally new way we are doing agriculture in the future. But at the moment, I don't see any anyone that has the perfect solution. So I'm really, really excited to be here at this time to watch all you guys having this new technologies and uh, let's see what happens. Yeah. And look at the nature, look at the nature because uh, we have other settings now. We will have dramatically changing settings outside. It uh, will get more and more difficult to do agriculture in, in some areas of this world. Thank you. 
Yeah, so my last point would be, I, I totally believe that decision-making systems, the decisions-making support uh, systems are very important because we have more and more data, more and more sensors creating more data and farmers cannot comprehend this. Um, so we need support there and, and solutions. But I also believe we need independent uh, support for farmers to decide which solutions are really helping them. We might also think about that the solutions pro, solution providers themselves, the companies also uh, integrate, let's say technologies that help farmers doing their own research, like, like on-farm research tools that are integrated into their solutions. Uh, I think the personal, the, the personal relationship is very, very important uh, as, as mentioned before. And I think also, uh, let's say new types of uh, revenue models, outcome-based uh, pricing, things like that, they can also help to increase adoption of uh, these systems. Thank you, Peter. So yes, this is actually the end. I, I'm really, really thankful for this wonderful round and thank you for participating. Thanks to the DLG Agrotechnica for hosting us, uh, host, hosting us on, our, on the platform. <laughs> and thanks for you, the speakers, for the participants in front of the screens all around um, i hope you have some yeah got some insights and have some inspiration um, please remember um, this uh, will be recorded and also uh, then on the um, on youtube and eventbrite if you registered um, via eventbrite i think you get all more information and uh, on linkedin so we also write a blog article about this so there's lots of information and we hope you uh, will have a great rest of the day. And yeah, before I forgot, again, the two more webinars are coming in the beginning of February. So please register and thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. 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 bye.